Well, good morning, and um, welcome to Mount Zion this morning. Um, it's, uh, it's great to see everyone here, whether you're a regular attender at Mount Zion or whether you're visiting. Uh, you're all very welcome. I should just say that uh, hopefully if the technology has worked again this week, that the, uh, the service is being shown live on uh, YouTube, um, so you can watch it again on the YouTube channel. So it's, um, it's hello and welcome to all, when, wherever and whenever you're watching. Uh, there's about uh, 60 to 70 people or views on the YouTube channel during the course of the week. Uh, so as well as everybody here this morning, uh, there'll be quite a few uh, other people catching up on what happens at Mount Zion on a Sunday morning uh, during the course of the week. Uh, this morning, we are delighted to be able to welcome Wynne Goss from uh, Bridgend to bring us the word. Uh, I don't think Wynne has preached at uh, Mount Zion before, I think I'm right, but I, I know that he preached at uh, Sarnai Community Church earlier this year, um, and his message there was, was very well received, uh, well, warmly received in fact, so we are, we are doubly grateful that uh, he has accepted our invitation to uh, speak with us uh, this morning and to, to cast the net wider uh, for his, uh, his ministry. And uh, Wynne is going to tell us uh, a little bit about that, I know, as he uh, speaks to us. Uh, so, how it's going to go this morning, after our first worship song, Carwin is going to come to lead us in prayer. And then, uh, after a, a time of worship, there'll be an opportunity for uh, children and young people to go out to junior church. Before all of that, inevitably, uh, I've been asked to make two short announcements. I always seem to be asked to make announcements. In fact, I've got three. Uh, first, the church annual general meeting is, uh, will be held on Monday the 24th of October at 7 p.m. here in Mount Zion. Uh, we'll be voting on new members and uh, deacons, so please try and attend. Uh, there will be postal voting, but we won't be voting via Zoom on this occasion. We have during uh, uh, the COVID uh, lockdown, but we won't on this occasion. We'll go back to normal in-person and postal voting. Now, if you're not a member of Mount Zion, but would like to attend to follow the discussion that's going on here, you are welcome to come, but you can't vote. So uh, even uh, you can ask one of the uh, elders and deacons about becoming a member. So even better than just turning up and listening but not actually being able to fully participate. Uh, secondly, um, <clears throat> next week um, we would uh, normally be sharing communion on a Sunday morning, first Sunday of the month, but we are going to postpone it by a week on this occasion. And that's because, as well as a guest preacher... Uh, we'll be sharing in the joy of celebrating uh, in the, uh, the dedicating six young children to the Lord. Uh, so let me say that again, six young children. I think that's the first time, certainly in the, the 12 years, thank you, in the, in the 12 years that I've been uh, attending uh, Mount Zion, that it's been that many young children all at one time. So those children are a blessing to their families already, uh, we know that, um, and they're also a blessing to this fellowship for those of us who come regularly and see them, hear, hear them sometimes, certainly see them running around. Um, so next week we'll have the, the privilege of celebrating with um, and supporting the parents as they dedicate their children to the Lord. So that's so important, isn't it? So that's something to give thanks for and to look forward to. 
And then finally, my last announcement, uh, next week we, we put out the, uh, the newsletter online uh, for the whole of the next month, for whole of October. So if anybody has any announcements, I've already been given one this morning, that needs to go in for October, please uh, just email them to the church, give them to the elders and deacons during the course of the next few days, please. Uh, so, that's enough from me, and I'm going to hand over to, uh, to the worship team, uh, the, the Harwood team, uh, to take us uh, through our first worship song. Thank you. Yeah, good morning. <clears throat> Anybody suffering from colds or been suffering from colds? Oh, I have. <clears throat> that's the joys of going back to school, isn't it? So, um... But we're here to worship God, aren't we? We're here to give God all the glory. Whatever's going on in our lives, whatever's going in on this morning, we're here to give him the glory. We're here to offer ourselves to him. Let's just pray. Let's stand and let's just pray together. Yeah, Father God in heaven, we, we just give this time to you. Lord, it's all about you. It's not about us, Lord. It's about giving you worship and honor and glory in everything we do and everything we say, everything we think. All that we do this morning, Lord, let's just offer our lives to you now, Lord, and uh, give ourselves to you. In Jesus' name. Amen. Sorry. Let's start again. I was in the wrong place.
Amen. Good morning, everyone. Um, so, some of you might be new here, might be visitors, not quite sure what prayer is or how it's done. And just a quick little reminder, it's just our main way of communicating with God. Um, we can take everything to him, and it comes in many forms and themes. Now, specifically, one of those themes is thankfulness and prayers of thanks. And when we uh, take these to God, it's really showing our praise and adoration for him. Now, it's one of the easiest things that we can do. Um, we're taught to give thanks from a very young age. Um, I'm not sure if anyone else here was given a little nudge by their mum or dad for not saying thank you for some money given by granny or granddad or something like that. But it's a common thing. But ironically, even though it's the easiest thing, we do it quite possibly the least. Um, and I think when you just need that little nudge again, just a little kick, not very hard, um, just, just to give thanks to God for all the great things he's done. Now, Aunt Zion itself, um, we've had a fantastic year. So, you know, so the doors have been opened again. We're allowed to praise and worship and honor together. Um, the camp, for the us who went, we got the great to see people being saved, young people. And we're so thankful for those of you who stayed here and prayed and supported us. Um, places for the Ukrainians to live, the donations, um, and the people that are helping tidy up and clean up for them. You know, there's so much to be thankful for, and the list just goes on and on and on. And so, when I go to pray now, I just, I might, 20 seconds of silence so that you guys can pray silently with yourselves about things that you're really thankful for. And then I'll just kick off and lead us through, okay? So just, yeah, whatever, bow your heads, do the hokey cokey, whatever, whatever your way of praying is, and uh, we'll get started. Just a quick 20 seconds. Yeah, Lord Jesus, thank you so much for dying on the cross for us. Thank you for forgiving our sins. And we welcome and praise you here. Lord, if there's someone new here or unsure what's going on, Lord, would you please step in for them? Father, we pray thanks so much for all the lives that have been saved over the last year, all the new faces we get to see, and we thank you for those we've lost, knowing that they've gone to see you. Lord, will we see more of that? Lord, thank you for the food that's on our plates. Thank you for the community that we share. Lord, we pray thanks for being able to heat our homes. And though it may be difficult at the time, Lord, we pray that you would still give, still sustain. Lord, we pray thanks for the kindness and the generosity of the church. And we pray that as we welcome more people in, we can keep showing that, that we keep making disciples. Lord, we thank you for so many lessons, so many teachings. We pray thanks for your presence, Lord. Be with us this week and for more to come. Amen. Chucks away, chaps. So um, we're going to have a time of um, three songs now. And um, during, during this time, there will be an offering to take in. But don't, if you're visiting, don't feel obliged to give. But you know, um, everything that is given, we give back to God to use for his glory. So uh, if you want to stand, if you want to sit, whatever, we're going to have this time of worship now. Oh 
Into the darkness you shine. 
God is greater. over us day and night for all eternity you never leave us lord we thank you lord that you are above all things in this world lord you're an awesome god nothing can stand against you lord and we praise you lord and we thank you lord and we thank you for the the gift of this offering this morning we thank you lord we pray that you would use it lord in this place and further afield for your glory in jesus name amen what gift of grace is Jesus my Redeemer?
Good morning, everyone. What a delight it is for Gwenda and I to be with you. I have known of you 45 years. It's taken you that long to invite me. <laughs> I've walked past your door, never been invited in. I, I began my ministry, believe it or not. I'm not going to go into the long details because I really have a, a strong word to give you. But... Um, I was saved Easter Sunday, 1977, after having a miraculous supernatural encounter with God where I heard his audible voice the Sunday before, telling me to, to not commit suicide. I was about to jump off a cliff, and, and I didn't, as you can see. <laughs> Seven days later, I watched the second half of the film, Jesus of Nazareth. I'd been raised a Methodist never understood the gospel. I had never, ever understood I could have a personal relationship with Jesus Christ. And there in my living room, I gave my life to Christ. And the only way I can describe it, it was as if somebody picked me up by the scruff of my neck, filthy black, like tar, dipped me in a bucket of bleach, and I came out sparkling clean. 
because my life was truly transformed, absolutely transformed. There was no way. My living testimony was so dramatic that people knew something had happened because what was happening was completely impossible for win. And it was just a few months later that I heard of an evangelist who was going to be coming to, New, uh, to Cardigan, to New Mill Church, or Full Gospel Church as it was then, just up the road here, and they had healings and signs and wonders and things like that, and I, I was fascinated. I, I read the story, and when I watched the film Jesus of Nazareth and saw the healings, I, I don't know if you're like me, but when I get into a film, a really good film, I forget where I am. I actually think I'm in the film, you know, and I get totally engrossed, engrossed and I was engrossed with Jesus making the blind see, the deaf hear, the cripples walk, the, the, everything that was happening, I was there as if I was part of the team. So when I got saved and gave my life to Jesus, I actually believed he would still do that. It came to a shock to find out most of the church didn't believe that. Uh, and so when I heard there was an evangelist coming to Cardigan, I picked up my tent, packed it in the car with my wife and my little three-year-old son, Matthew, and we came to stay here in Gubert. And that was the last week of August. It was August bank holiday. And on the Friday night, Peter the evangelist picked me out of the crowd and began to lay hands upon me because the Lord was telling him to tell me he, he, I was being sent into all the world to preach the gospel of Jesus Christ and signs and wonders would follow me. Well, imagine now I'm just a few months old. I don't know anything yet. And I'm listening to him going, what? And he looks at me, he said, there's a prayer line there. And it was about four, they'd called about 40 people who needed healings and miracles. And he said, just go and lay hands on people and pray for them. Well, I didn't know how to pray. I'd never been taught to pray. Isn't that a shame? The church had never taught me to pray. I had no idea how to pray. The only thing I did know was to give thanks. Because I was a musician. And so the worship side of things got me. And so I just pick up my guitar and sing to the Lord all day and all night that I could. And the presence of God was always with me. And so all I thought I could do was, well, I lay hands on these people and I'll just say thank you. Forty people got healed. Forty people. Cancers disappeared. The blind saw. A deaf person saw. A person that was, was uh, uh, crippled walked in the first occasion. So all that news got back to Bajen before I did. Don't ask me how that it happens, but it does. And it got back to Bajen, and there was queues outside the Methodist church because the only place, the thing I could do was go back to the Methodist church and, and worship the Lord. Well, there was a queue of people outside at the end saying, is it true? Is it true? And I said, yeah. So they said, well, pray for us. Well, the first person I saw was a lady called Elaine who knew me from about the age of eight or nine. And she came up running outside before I could pray for him. And she just said, when? When? Is it true? And I, and I looked, I said, what? And she just grabbed me. But before I could say anything, she grabbed me. And the power of the Lord touched her body and knocked her flat out on the floor. And she was healed. I didn't even know she was sick. And from that first year, I led over 220 people to Christ. And we saw every conceivable miracle, even somebody raised from the dead. That word thanks, you got it up here. That's actually the Old Testament. We, we don't have to enter his gates with thanksgiving. We're already in him. If we're in Christ, we're already inside those gates. So the thanksgiving doesn't get us in. It allows him out. Because when Jesus broke bread and multiplied the fish for the multitude, it says all he did was raise it up and say thanks. You see, thanksgiving at the end of your prayer releases it to be miraculous. Mark 11 says, when you stand to pray, give thanks. Why? You're saying amen to it. You're saying, yes, it will happen. Because why pray a prayer in just desperation? Why don't you pray it in faith? Believing that the answer is already yes and amen in Christ Jesus. Because that's what it says in Hebrews. If it's in the Bible, it's our portion. We can pray for it and it'll happen. So the question is, is are you a believer or an unbelieving believer? 
Is Jesus the same yesterday, today, and to forever? Amen. Well, he is in Cardigan. If he is in heaven, he is in Cardigan because there's Christians here. And if there's Christians here, he's asking the same question. Do you believe I can do it? Do you believe I'm the same all the time? I never change. See, the church can go up and down. Circumstances can go up and down. But he never changes. And therefore, his promise cannot change. I think I need to ask you to do something. Turn to the person alongside you and say, he must be preaching to you because it's not getting to me at all. <laughs> <laughs> well, I'm going to look at my first scripture in a moment. And you can see Gwenda and I. This, by the way, this is Gwenda, my beautiful wife. Um, please say hello to her at the end. Don't make her feel a stranger. She's a family member. We're going to turn to Matthew 13. But just as you look at that, can I just point out these three things? I've got some books here. The first book I wrote is Don't Kick the Donkey, Ride It. It's a book about the preparation, how God prepared Israel for thousands of years for the coming of Jesus. Jesus died, actually, on the day called the Day of Preparation. So Calvary is not the main event. It's the preparation for the main event. The main event was what happened after Calvary when Jesus walked out the tomb. So this book talks about how the Lord prepares you for the miraculous, how God prepares you for the supernatural, and I show it all the way through the Old Testament and the New Testament and in my life. This book is alignment for assignment. This one is preparation. This one is reformation. People all over the world know that I'm from Wales, and they say, oh, please, please tell us about the revival. And I go, okay. So I tell him about the revival. And at the end, I always say the same thing. Please, if you're praying for revival in Wales, stop. We don't need a revival. We need a reformation. Because revival just means to revive something, means to bring back what was already there. I don't want more of what we've already had. I want what the real thing is that Jesus promised us that we could have. I want a reformation. The only way we're going to see God do what he promised he could do for us and in us and through us is if the whole understanding of the church is reformed back into a model of New Testament church. So this is reformation. This one is invasion. What happens after reformation, how the church will work, etc. And this is a, a worship album. I said to you, I began as a Methodist. So I raised as a Methodist and I was born and I went born again and I went back to the Methodist church because I had knew, no idea after. All I knew was to just join other people who were worshipping God and I found in the Methodist church some, some actual born again Christians. They weren't there when I left at 17 years of age but they were back there when I was 24. So they began to nurture me in the things of the Lord and encourage me how to read my Bible and and, and lent me books and lent me uh, worship tapes, although there weren't many of those things around in those days, and I just began to grow in my faith, and as I said, I came here to New Mill Full Gospel Church, and there I had the call of God in my life to go to all the nations, and from that moment on, I did. But there was no technology in those days, and so the only nations I could go to was Wales. I went to a few imaginations, and, I, invo and I, I invaded a few denominations, but I didn't go anywhere outside of Wales for a number of years, and then I went to England and Scotland and Ireland, and I can tell you now that over the last 45 years, the ministry has gone probably to about 50 nations until 2018, when the Lord told me to, to begin a, a TV program every week and send it out online and put it on YouTube. Well, instantly, overnight, we went to 150 nations. And now we have no idea how far our ministry has gone or because we get messages coming from the most remote places. I'm talking about the middle of a jungle in the middle of Ghana. Somebody has picked up a second-hand copy of one of my books. And I say, praise God, you can discard me, but somebody else, the Lord will use it to, to bless somebody else, you know. So it's lovely how the, the thing is moving right around the world, so... You can find us on YouTube. You can find us on the internet. Just Wingos Ministries. And I'd love to be in connection with you at any time to continue our relationship. But let me just start with Matthew 13, 53 to 58. When he had come in his own country, he taught them in their synagogue 
so that they were astonished and said, where did this man get this wisdom and these mighty works? Is this not the carpenter's son? Is not his mother called Mary? And his brothers, James, Josie, Simon, and Judas, and his sisters, are they not all with us? Where then did he get this man get all these things? So they were offended at him. Well, that's the first question. Why would you get offended at somebody knowing God more than you? Why would you get offended at saying things that if it's Jesus the Messiah? Well, it's because they don't know he's Jesus the Messiah. They're offending him because they know his background. They're offended that he's come in and is knowing this God better than they are and is doing signs and wonders and they haven't seen signs and wonders in thousands of years. It's, we have to be really careful that when God moves, we don't expect him to come in the package we want him to come in. He never does that. He always comes in a way we don't expect and he comes in a time we don't expect and usually speaks to a person we don't expect. So expect... The unexpected is a good, a good thing to hold on to because when God moves, it's always going to put your nose out of joint in love. Why? Well, because if he does comes, as we've always known, then he, you're asking him to come down to your level when God is always asking the, the church to come up to his level and see everything the way he sees it, think the way he thinks, act the way he acts, believe the way he believes. Amen. Am I preaching better than you are amen in? Yes. Oh, okay. Are you breathing? Yes. But Jesus said to them, a prophet is not without honor except in his own country and in his own house. Now he did not do many mighty works there, because of their unbelief. They did not believe who he was. Therefore, even though he was God incarnate, even though he was the Son of God, even though there was nothing at all that he could not do, he could not do it. We sang a song, nothing can stand against us. Yes, there is. Something can stop God being mighty. Something can stop God being a healer. Something can stop God doing the miraculous. It's called our unbelief. When we don't expect God to do the miraculous, do you know something? We offend him. He does not understand it at all because he is a God of faith and faith pleases him. So when you believe him, it pleases him. When you expect him to be who he says he is, that pleases him. When you don't expect him to do something or when you doubt he's going to ever do it for you, then you don't please him. Because you're living with unbelief. He doesn't need any Christian or any person living in unbelief. He wants us to live in belief. Let's move on to Acts chapter 2, 5 to 13. And we'll see the same thing happen here. At the day of Pentecost. And there were dwelling in Jerusalem Jews, devout men from every nation under heaven. And when this sound occurred... This multitude came together and were confused because everyone heard them speak in his own language. Then they were all amazed and marveled, saying to one another, Look, are not all these who speak Galileans? How is it that, that we hear each in our own language in which we were born? And then he names the languages. I won't go into all of them. You can read them. It goes on down in the verse. We hear them speaking in our own tongues the wonderful works of God. So they were all amazed and perplexed, saying to one another, whatever could this mean? While others, mocking, said, they're full of wine, new wine. You see, the, the crowd, when Jesus walked into the synagogue, was instantly split. For, against. Faith and belief, open, closed. The moment the Holy Spirit came and filled all the disciples in the upper room, all the people in the upper room filled with the same Spirit that raised Jesus from the dead, the same Spirit that talked through Jesus, the same Spirit that did the miracles through Jesus, were in them, on them, and were operating through them, and it had the same effect. And the multitude Wondered what on earth is it? They didn't reject it. They didn't understand it. What was it? They were perplexed, but they did not resist it, while some mocked. 
So instantly, it's, it shows us that when the Holy Spirit moves, it's going to challenge everything about us in the way we, we think and the way we believe and the, the experiences we've always had. He's come to do that. That's normal, my friend. We shouldn't get into the hump about it. Hello? Can I, how many people would like a move of God right here in Cardigan? Well, that's six of us. <laughs> it's amazing. That amazes me. I've just asked you a simple question. And it splits. Who wants the move of God? And so few people, hands go up. And you think, what's happened to the church that they don't want a move of God in Wales again? Do you want people saved? Because if you don't want them saved, you're saying you want them to go to hell. Do you want your family and your wider family to go to hell, or do you want them to go to heaven? Well, if you want them to go to heaven, the only way they can go to heaven is by accepting Christ as their personal Savior and repenting of their sin. In other words, getting born again. That's the only way they can get into heaven. There is no other way. Hello? Only one way. Yeah, it's out there. It goes around in a circle. Well, we're used to that one way, but if somebody says there's only one, to, one way to heaven, we get offended. But my grandson is a wonderful boy. So is mine. That makes no difference. God does not a dictator. He doesn't force people to come into heaven without their will. They have to choose. Do you want Cardigan to go to hell or do you want it saved? Hello? Well, if you want, can I say if you want it saved, the word there is sozo. And the word sozo doesn't just mean saved, it means delivered, healed, and made whole, protected, and provided for. If I want someone saved, I want them healed, I want them well, I want them set free. I don't want them living in fear and doubt and guilt and unbelief. I want them free so they can enjoy the fullness of what Jesus died for them to have. Jesus didn't die just for you to go to heaven. Je can I tell you that nowhere in the, <laughs> even in Genesis, when God makes Adam, there's nowhere saying he made Adam to send him to heaven. And nowhere does it show in the New Testament that God wants someone saved so they can go to heaven. Can I tell you it's the reverse? He wants people saved so his kingdom can come from heaven on earth as it is in heaven. That's the prayer of a saint. That's the prayer of a believer. That It's wonderful we might go to heaven, but the idea is that while we live, heaven comes to us and begins to invade our life and begins to touch our life completely. And I'm preaching better than you're breathing loudly. Okay. It's two different responses. Unbelief or offense. And yet Jesus is the truth. And he came to the synagogue. He came to the church. The church of his day. And could do such little works because of what? They were offended. And therefore they stayed in unbelief. I'm going to show you what happens. I don't know what your mother was like or whatever, but I had a wonderful mum, absolutely adorable. I knew she loved me from the moment I, I can remember to the day she died. I, I just knew her love for me. But my mum to cook in was um, a challenge. My mum would come in the house and I would be doing some homework when I was a teenager. She said, son, do you want like a cup of coffee? I said, yes, please, mum. So she'd bring me back a few minutes later. She'd bring, put it down in front of me and after a few minutes to let me cool down, I'd pick it up and drink. Have you ever put in your mouth something that you think is one thing, but it actually turns out to be another? It takes a split second. Your taste buds know instantly. They know something's wrong, but your head doesn't know what's wrong, and then it takes a couple of seconds, and before you realize, Mama, you poured your tea into my coffee. Oh, did I? I'm sorry. You see, I, there was enough coffee in there for me to think it was coffee, but there was so much tea in there as well that it tricked me for just a second, and I just had to, ah, my response was, Mom, what are you doing? Oh, we used to have this wonderful 
thing every time we had a meal. We never quite knew what we were going to have. <laughs> My mother would have a sugar bowl and a salt bowl side by side in the kitchen. So there were some times where we, we would have a, a meat pie, a, you know, a corned beef pie or something, and you'd be eating it going, the same thing. You'd have the taste buds would know something's not quite. You look at the pie, you can see it's right, but the taste buds, buds tell you it's not right. It's not. And then a couple of seconds later, you go, mother, you put the sugar in the pie again, or the other way around, an apple pie. And you'd put a mouthful of salt in your mouth, you know, and it, you spit it back out. But it would be that split second. Why? Well, because of your expectancy. You expect this, but when that happens, ah, there's a reaction. Well, the same happens when there's a move of the Holy Spirit. The move of the Holy Spirit doesn't move always the way you expect. He doesn't always move at the time you expect. In fact, I've seen miracles in the middle of Tesco's. I've seen people come to Christ in an aeroplane when all I was going to do was put the recliner up and go to sleep. And 30 minutes later, I've led a lady from Canada to Christ. Hello? I've watched people get saved in the most unusual places. I've seen people healed in the most unusual places at the most unusual time in the most unusual <laughs> ways. Of course, it's normal for people to spit in someone's tongue, isn't it? It's in your Bible. Jesus spat, spat on the tongue of a dumb person and they were healed. So anyone that's dumb this morning, I'd like you to come forward because I feel that same <laughs> anointing. Hello? Imagine coming forward because you've got a problem with your eyes. And I stand here and say, well, hang on a second. Go, go fetch me a bucket of that earth from outside a moment. And as I get the bucket of earth, I go... <laughs> to rub it in your eyes. So, I mean, some people would just go, you're not doing that. You're not doing that. That's ridiculous. That's spit. You're not putting that in my eyes. Do you want a healing or not? Because everything like that was out of ordinary to the disciples. And I'm going to show you Jesus does it over and over and over to the people. Read your New Testament. Read your Gospels and you see Jesus turning up at a way they didn't expect him to turn up, doing things they didn't expect him to do. But there was a multitude of people who still responded to the shockable, to the not normal. They still responded. They didn't put up unbelief. And Jesus was able to move in the multitudes when he couldn't move in the church of the day because the multitudes weren't so Locked up, and that's not the way it's always been done. If it's always the way we've always seen it done, then it's probably not God. Because God always changes from faith to faith, glory to glory. Every move of God restores back to the church, or is trying to restore back to the church, something that's been lost. Ooh. So why are there so many denominations? Because the last people to see a move of God aren't expecting a new one. And when the new one comes, it's not in the format. Sorry? It's not in the format of a Methodist or a Baptist or a Pentecostal. Hello? Why? If we're not careful... We try to pull God into our box instead of realizing if you put God in a box, he tends to get out because he's the resurrection and the life. You can't keep him in and you can't keep him out. Look at this quickly. The scribes and the people in the tabernacle, the synagogue didn't recognize him. The scribes and the Pharisees didn't recognize him. And yet after the resurrection, did you notice the same pattern happened with his own disciples? Outside the tomb, Mary runs past a living Jesus to visit a dead one. 
because the living Jesus doesn't look like the one that she put in the grave three days before. Why? Because he changed. Come on, get a grip to this. This is not revolution. This is just what it says. But your brain has not been told that because you've either never read that before or never heard it preached. Well, I'm saying it to you today. Read it because I'm going to show you one verse of Scripture that shares to the most great revelation that we can understand what was happening in the hearts and the minds of the disciples at that moment. She only recognized it was Jesus when he said, Mary... And she recognized the voice. Because the word of God, the voice of God, never changes. But the carcass it comes in can. Thank God he can come in a Welshman. He can come in a Welshman even from Bridgend. He can come from Cardigan. And he can come from Egypt. He can come from England, Scotland, Ireland. In fact, he can come from the last place you want him to come from. Using the wrong person in your eyes. So who's the first evangelist when Jesus rises from the dead? It's a woman. What do you think that did with even the disciples? Because that was not part of the plan. That's not the culture. You don't, God never used a woman. God always used men, but God says, well, everything's changed. And so a woman says, he is alive. And they didn't believe her. As she goes to hang on to this Jesus, he stands back and goes, Ooh, no, 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 no. Don't put me in your box. Don't pull me back to where you want me to be. He says, just go and tell them my brothers and sisters where I'm, I'm alive. And boom, he disappears. I could do that. Shall I do it right now? <laughs> what do you think if I did that to you? How do you think you'd react? Do you think you'd all stand up going, oh, praise the Lord. That's, what, that's magnificent. I like it when wind does that. I don't think so. I think most of you would either fall over, mouths wide open, fall back, run out the building, anything, because you think, oh my God, that's just... But he did it. Jesus just did it in front of Mary. She'd never seen him be, do it before. Why? Because after the resurrection, he starts doing things he was never able to do before because something has changed. He disappears, and he appears on the Emmaus Road. The two disciples don't recognize him until they persuade him into the house and they break bread with him. And he, he sits in the chair he sat in in the upper room, the visiting Messiah's empty chair, which was always kept at a communion table for the Messiah to sit. And he sits there and then he takes the bread and does exactly what he did in the upper room with the same words, takes a cup and says the same things. And they suddenly realize it's Jesus. And bam, he's gone again. They run, breaking the law, they run all the way back to Jerusalem, bash. anybody's ever said in 45 years I need a microphone <laughs> but thank you <laughs> don't you think the church needs to understand the uh, true identity of Jesus is not the one we see in the gospels that's the one that was limited by a physical body born in the earth but coming out of the tomb was one who was the Lord of all glory the Alpha and Omega the beginning and the the one that knows no death. He's able to rise up and come back down. He's able to appear and disappear. He is not coming back to your level. He's asking you to change your understanding of who he truly is. He's not that carpenter's boy. He's not Mary's boy. He's not the B-A-S-T-A-R-D that they all knew he was. 
He's the Lord of all glory. He is the healer because he knows no sickness whatsoever. And if you touch him just like Elaine touched me all those years ago, and bam, the power of God knocked her down. That had nothing to do with wind. That was just Jesus doing something through me and in me at that moment. And she had to see it wasn't wind. This is something that God is doing in the earth. And God wants to do the same things through every part of his body called the church. Because he knows no sickness. There is no sickness in heaven. Therefore, he can make it happen on earth that there is no sickness in your life that can prevent you fulfilling the call of God and living in the fullness of what Jesus died for you. Wow, I know that's a shock to some, but I'm sorry. Somebody needs to wake the church up in Wales because she's more concerned about what the devil's like than she is about what God's like. We've made this devil a big, big devil, and as if Jesus is only just beating him. He's already defeated him. He's already paid the price. He's already done everything he needs to do. And if you just get born again, the same spirit that raised him from the dead, that caused him to minister the way he did, will reside in you in a bodily form, it says in Ephesians. Well, what for? Goosebump moments? Or to do the work of the ministry. It says he walked through the walls and they didn't recognize him. Excuse me? Excuse me? They didn't recognize him? They only buried him three days before. He comes back eight days later, if you remember, just for Thomas. And still they don't recognize him. Why? How could they not recognize him just eight days later? Could it be that he changed his appearance and changed his appearance and changed his appearance just to show I'm not the way you think I am? You see, we have this image of what Jesus is. It's a flat one. It's not 3D. It's just flat. But Jesus was breaking their culture he was breaking their education. He was bre breaking their religious mindset. He was breaking everything he could break because he was trying to say, listen, it's an upside, upside down kingdom. The kingdom of God is not like the kingdoms of man. The kingdoms of man are not like the kingdoms of God. And the things that work on earth do not work in the kingdom of heaven. And the things of the kingdom of heaven will supersede the things of the earth if you just cooperate with them. I've nearly finished. It says, he went from there to the Mount of Ascension a few days later, and there they gathered to him. But it says, and still, they knew it was Jesus, but still they doubted. Why would you doubt it's Jesus if you saw him just a few days before? And saw him a few days before that. And saw him a few days before that. And a few days for 40 days. Don't you think by now at the end of 40 days they would have absolutely known it was Jesus? Not if he kept changing his appearance. No. Mark chapter 16. And I'm going to finish with this. After that, that Mark 16, 12 says, After that he appeared in another form to two of them as they walked and went into the country. This is the Emmaus Road. You see, all of my life, I went to a Methodist church somewhere in Wales. And when I was nine, ten years of age, my father brought us back to his hometown, Bridgend, and we attended the Methodist church. And so my understanding of Jesus and what he was like was conditioned by what I heard. What I heard from the Sunday school teachers, what I heard from the youth teachers, what I heard from the pulpits with the various ministers that used to stand up there and preach the gospel. So my vision of Jesus was predetermined. But when I became a Christian, I had this incredible encounter with God as I read the New Testament. I found that an awful lot of what I'd been taught wasn't true. Let me just tell you, can, can I tell you, even traditions pass on theology to us. 
And if we're not careful, if the tradition is out of alignment to the New Testament, we get the wrong picture. Let me just ask, like I ask a, a thousand people, how many wise kings came to visit Jesus? You've obviously, by your giggling, some of you already know the answer. It's not three. But they always portray three. And so therefore you would grow up believing there were three wise men. But this doesn't say there was three at all. It could have been one. It could have been ten. I don't know. But it, it says three gifts. Except so because it says three gifts, there must be three wise men. Ha! Huh. So if it's not right at the beginning, it's really not right at the end. Because it gets bigger and bigger and bigger. And it gets harder and harder and harder to get people free of what they believed when they were smaller. Yeah? Here's one of them. Have you ever had one of those moments that you have always thought one thing, but all of a sudden, as you're reading your Bible, it's like as if scales drop off your eyes, and bam! You see something you've never seen before, or you've seen it before, but never in the way you see it today. All of a sudden, the emphasis that was on the scripture before has shifted, and you see something that was always there, but you never saw it. Do you see that script? Could you put that scripture back up for me, please? And then he appeared in another form. One day at 11 o'clock in the morning, I'm having my coffee. I've got my Bible in my lap because I'm preparing to preach a message in my church the following Sunday. When I suddenly, at the end of Mark's gospel, because that's what I was looking at, I saw this one verse and one word popped out. Form. And he appeared in another form. And for the first time in my life, I thought, another form? What's it mean, another form? There's only one form, surely. And so I got, because I want to prove everything and I want to really get into the grips, I get my Greek concordances out, I get my lexicons, I get my word dictionaries out of everything I can think of. I look at all the ways of this verse and look at this one verse, one word to find out what it really means. And I want to tell you today, I can tell you what it really means. Form. That on its own perhaps is not such a shock. If I said the word format, because that's what that word means, format. How many of you can remember audio cassettes? How many remember all of a sudden the 5,000 audio cassettes that you had on your shelves suddenly became useless because CDs? Yeah. And all of a sudden you think, my goodness, my tapes won't work on the CD player. So you get rid of all the tapes and you start doing the same thing with all the CDs. And then all of a sudden something happens because a format changes again. And now you can get everything on Alexa. <laughs> you can get everything downloaded off the internet. You don't need a physical anything. You just need an iPad and you can go anywhere and read any Bible, any book, any, listen to any tape, go visit every church. This church today is visited, I think, by people that have never been here, don't know you, but they're watching through my, my connections. Because you can go anywhere. Why? The format changed. And when the format changed, the original form is automatically made obsolete. And if you don't believe me, read the book of, uh, of Hebrews and you'll find it. The, the, it's called by Paul in the Ephesians and Corinthians, the old has gone, the new has come. It's a different format. You can't play audio tapes on CDs and CDs on DVDs and you can't, you can't do the things that you used to do in the way that you, you have to do it today. It's changed, and you have to respond to that. When a move of God comes, something changes, and the way things were done have to cooperate with him because that's how we move forward in the things of God and allow him to be who he is in all his glory, in all his fullness. It says that when the disciples stood on the Mount of Ascension, Jesus was saying goodbye. 
And all of a sudden, it says he's lifted up in the air. What do you think he would have done at that point? said, oh, there you go, he's off. <laughs> Let's go and get lunch. Do you think you'd, what do you think you'd, if you're anything like me, you can all just about remember black and white TVs. <laughs> Mum and dad would come in and go, okay, television's over, it's time for bed. Ah, uh, mum. When they told, turned the old black and white TV off, the white picture just went down to a tiny dot and then started to disappear. And as a four-year-old, I was... Because <laughs> I wanted to watch it disappear. And of course, my mother would say, win. And I'd go, what? And I'd look back, it's gone. <laughs> always, always. I never actually saw it go. Well, it says when they're just watching Jesus ascend... They're so busy watching what's going and what's leaving that they don't notice what's arrived. It says two men in white. They've just arrived and said, men of Galilee, what are you looking at? Now, that's a rhetorical question. They don't need the answer. They know what they're looking at. They're all going, they know what he's look, they're all looking at. And it's almost like the disciples could have said, well, that's a stupid question. We're looking at Jesus leaving. We've never seen him do this before. We've ne and they said, well, don't worry. This same Jesus is coming back. Now, note this. The emphasis, the emphasis, the emphasis is not the mode of transport. The emphasis in the Greek language is the Jesus that you're seeing leaving. It's him that's coming back. Well, how can another Jesus come back? Well, the church thinks so. This same Jesus that's been doing all these miracles, all these appearing and disappearing, this same Jesus. Don't expect the Jesus of Nazareth. Expect the Lord of all glory to come back. It's not the mode of transport. I don't care if he comes back on a motorbike or a cloud. It makes no difference how he comes back. But there's the same Jesus. Why? Because he's not coming back for something that does not reflect him. He's coming back for a bride who has been formed and made ready for him. Like a a glove is made ready for a hand. And my God, we need a miracle. We need a miracle reformation in the church to get the church to move so that when he comes, it says in 1 John 3, we shall be like him. Oh, no, 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 no. I, I can't be right, can it? I can be like Jesus. Well, why did you get saved if you can't? What do you pray when you see all the mess in your life? Lord Jesus, leave me the way I am? Or Jesus, help me change? Change to what? To change to something that's just a little bit better? Or be transformed into his likeness? My friends... I said I had a heavy word for you. This is not the word I'd have given you. I'd have given you the one that made you laugh and like me. But when Jesus is speaking like this to his church, there's an urgency. And he must trust you. Because he sent me to tell it to you. So there must be something he is about to do in you and with you and for you in response to your faith and your prayers in Cardigan. He hasn't forgotten your prayers. He hasn't forgotten any prayer that's ever been prayed in this community, in this congregation. All the years, he's not forgotten one thing. It must be time right now for him to come and do it. Because he's asking me to ask you, let him go. Let him go from the box you've got him in. Let the service go from the box you've got it in. Can I tell you, when the Holy Spirit moves again in Cardigan, and by the grace of God moves in Mount Zion congregation, whatever time of day or whatever time of night, whatever day of the week it should be, when he moves, I'm telling you now, it will be called Messy Church. He will mess up your theology. He will mess up your culture. He will mess up even, the, even your physics. As when you watch men who had polio and 10 seconds later can play football with you. When a blind person, the first public meeting of my own ministry 
was in, uh, was in Brinkethen in 1978 in, outside of Bridge End. It was, I had no idea, it was a center for the occult. And yet the Lord had told me, hold a meeting in that building, send out the leaflets, hand out leaflets all over that area. 220 people came to hear an unknown preacher. I tried to preach, I tried to preach on Noah. And I closed my Bible after about five minutes and said, I, I can't preach, I'm not a preacher. But I can tell you what Jesus did in my life. And I told my test me, 25 people got saved, they ran forward. And the, then I called a prayer line. I didn't know what to do in a prayer line. I just watched Peter Scudden, the evangelist, call a prayer line. So I called a prayer line. Anybody that's sick, come forward. Jesus will heal you. <laughs> not might. Jesus will heal you. And all these people started coming forward. And all of a sudden over this side, I saw two young lads leading a, a, an older gentleman, probably in his 80s. And I thought, oh, bless their hearts. They're helping him come forward. Because I could see he had, he had some, a crutch or sticks or something. And they came forward. And I don't know what to pray. I'm still in that same early stage. I don't know how to pray, really. So I walked up to him. And I just put my hand on his heart. And I just prayed this prayer at the leading of the Spirit. Lord, open his eyes so he can see you. I'm talking about the eyes of his heart. I have no idea this man is blind. Jesus did open the man's heart, but he opened his eyes as well. And about five minutes later, he's running up and down, running around the building, shouting and screaming, and everyone is in awe because God has healed. Why? Because it's so unexpected. Well, it shouldn't be. It shouldn't be unexpected. It should be expected. And so I urge you, brothers and sisters, from this day forward, expect the unexpected. Expect miracles. Expect the answers to prayer. When you come, expect him to mess up your service. Sorry, guys. Because I've been there, leading worship, and boom, the Holy Spirit moves. Well, what do you want? More worship or the Holy Spirit moving? What's the idea? The you know, Holy Spirit doing what he wants to do. That's the idea of what we gathered for. Would you stand with me today? I'm going to hand this back. I'm going to pray for you if you will. Now, if, if by any chance I've offended you, up there, down here, over there or over there, I I don't apologize. <laughs> so I ask you to do something that I can't do. Forgive me. Because you've got to anyway. Because the Bible says you have to love me. And if you don't love me down here, I promise you when you get to heaven, if I get there before you, you'll be, you'll be right next door to mine. And you'll live with me for a long, long time used to that to love me because I am actually lovable thank you for that underwhelming response <laughs> I'm lovable aren't I Gwen yeah my grandkids think I'm lovable Jesus thinks I'm lovely Father I, I pray for my dear brothers and sisters I want to thank you as we began this service by thanking I'm going to thank you I'm going to thank you for a good work that you began in them. Uh, over a hundred years ago, whenever it was, however it began, I want to thank you that some people somewhere in Cardigan received you and had a vision to establish a ministry that now is called Mount Zion. So I want to thank you. I want to thank you for all the years that people have worshipped you here. And all the years people have prayed here. And all the years that people have preached here and read the word from here. All the years that people have come here and held fast to the promises of God. All the people who have come here looking for miracles, Lord, and looking for you to do something. All the years that some people from here have told others about the love that Jesus has for them. I want to thank you right now. But Lord, I want to thank you with expectancy. I don't want to just thank you for what you did. I want to thank you. You haven't finished 
the good work that you began. I want to thank you that from the day onwards, you are going to move by your might and by your strength and by your power in your word. You're going to move in this congregation and in this town. And you're going to complete the work that you began. You're going to finish what you started. You're going to reveal more at the end than you did in the beginning. We want to thank you for all that you have been. And we want to thank you today for all that you are. You are more than a conqueror. You are more than victorious. You are the healer. You are the deliverer. You are the restorer. You are the lover and the forgiver. And I ask you in Jesus' name, you gave grace to people that their hearts would receive you. I pray that you give grace to this congregation and to all that are listening and watching that your spirit touch them right now, that their hearts be open to let you be who you really, really are, not what they've always thought or known you are, that they might receive you in your glory. Father, right now, I ask in Jesus' name. And if you believe that, say amen. 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 Gwenda and I are going to be standing over you. If you want to come talk to us, want us to pray with you, or want us to tell you more about the books and stuff, we will. But don't forget, you can stay in touch with us and watch a little of what we're doing all over the world by those areas I told you about, YouTube and the website. God bless you. Thank you to the elders for... <laughs> being brave enough to let me come. I hope I can come back one day. Amen. glad you came this morning uh, here to share that message, hear that word. Um, many thanks to, uh, to Wynne uh, and to Gwenda uh, for that message. Um, thanks to Carwin for his prayer and Stephen Vicky for uh, leading us in worship. 
Uh, please take the opportunity to speak with Wynne and uh, Gwenda, look at the mission materials that, uh, that they have while they're here with us today, and uh, you know, follow online. Coffee and tea are available, so um, yes, while you're chatting, uh, you, can, uh, you can share in coffee and tea. It'll be brought out on trays, um, <clears throat> to, uh, so you can remain here. There are some tables in the vestry for those who prefer to, uh, to sit and share fellowship for a while. Uh, so let's close uh, with the words of the blessing. Can I suggest that, um, well, let's look up, let's look around us. Um, and as we say the words of the blessing to each other, the Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord make his face shine upon you and be gracious to you. The Lord turn his face towards you and give you peace. Amen. Thank you.